decide as you go along, uh, you want to uh, attend a person's workshop and you've got that decision made, you can sign up for one or two because there will be two a, a day. I've, did we talk about a workshop for you, Dr. Parson? You won't want to have one. Okay. All right. Other than that, are there any questions up to this point? If so, the answer is yes, no, and probably. Okay, we're underway, we're ready to go. Somebody hasn't calmed down yet, and I'll give you four seconds to do that. In the back, please, no more talking, no more speaking around the tables, please. Thanks very much. We are pleased that again, after six years, Dr. Hazel Parcells can be with us at our conference here in Florida. She spoke at our first conference seven years ago, that was, in Denver, and she's back with us again today. Dr. Parcells has behind her name, if you've noticed in the program, DC, chiropractic, ND, and PhD. <clears throat> she was born in Colorado, Glenwood Springs, September 28th, 1889. Put that into your calculator and figure that one out, if you will. So she can tell you truthfully that if you drink a glass of milk every morning for 1,200 months, you'll be 100 years old. Oh, <laughs> she says she resembles that remark. <clears throat> she don't like my translations either. <laughs> she was told when she was at 40 years old that she had very little time to live. And so 60 years later, she's waiting for their prediction. She's worked over the years with such well-known names as Dr. Kohler, Ruth Drown, Alice Bailey, Royal Lee, and who knows how many other well-known names, just to mention a few. She founded the Parcells System of Scientific Living in 1947, and the school is still going strong. I called last summer, or last spring, a year ago almost, to talk about the possibility of her speaking in Denver last August. But she was busy that time conducting another school, another week-long school. So she did seem to be attracted to the idea of coming to Florida in the wintertime, and that worked out to all of our benefit and all of our delight. Dr. Hazel Parcells is a legend in her own time. She teaches people nutrition. She teaches them a number of things <clears throat> in the health field. I've heard her name uh, for many years before we first met, and you're going to hear her for some time yet to come. Aren't you happy that we can have today Dr. Hazel Parcells with us from Albuquerque, New Mexico. <laughs> Alice Adams is her associate and with her all the time and helps her in her work and in her school. And, that, and that's who Alice is. I forgot to mention or introduce Alice. I can put this here. Well, maybe it better be right here. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for a very lovely introduction. I have to remember I've got to move this. And it's wonderful to be here where we can kind of come out with a few truths about things. However, 
we wonder sometimes if it's even safe to try to tell the truth. If it doesn't happen to be formulated by the other side of the house, we aren't supposed to say much about it. I've looked forward to this meeting for several reasons. The research that I have done in all these years, where I have lived with it, proved it, seen the changes that has come in, I take you down that long pathway of memory of a hundred years. Of course, the first few years wasn't so productive, I'll admit. But as time went on and you grow into these things, we change with them. And as I look back down that road and see all the changes that I've seen come into our lives, our environment, everything pertaining to life itself, it creates many, many memories. When I stop to think that I saw the general use of the telephone come into being, at that point, I was on a farm or a ranch as we know it in the West. And uh, it was a party line. And if the phone rang, everybody on the whole line was on the phone. So gossip and information traveled over those lines, very rapidly sometimes, and not always to everyone's advantage, but it was there. Then the next big event was the automobile. Again, I saw this come into being I saw the first car that was turned out, and we were driving horses and buggies at that time, and the horses didn't like those automobiles very much. There was always a sort of a discussion about who was going to use the highway or the roads as we knew them. Then World War I came into being, and I became a war bride. So I lived through many of the disadvantages, and I can't think of any one advantage, during that period of time. I saw the terrible, and lived through, the terrible epidemic of what they call flu. Really, in reality, it was the Black Plague. I saw the coffins piled up on the stations for shipping, heard them come in in truckloads at night. They could not get anything in the hospitals, and really, that was probably an advantage. My husband had the flu, and his uh, officers' quarters, none of them could go to the hospital, and they all lived. So. We go on again down through time, and we find many changes coming in. We think today that we're buying nutrition when we buy the vegetables and things that are grown. That has changed. All of this has changed. I have watched this change. Now during this, I'm going back to World War I again. And during that time, I contracted tuberculosis. I'm not a person that pays a lot of attention to being sick. I have too many interesting things to do. So I didn't give it much thought until finally it came to the point where I was hemorrhaging from a kidney, from my lungs, my heart was so enlarged, the valves were so damaged that medical science had nothing to offer. They could do nothing. So, again, what brought this change? It carried on. 
Then, at this point, because they had nothing to offer in the way of correction, I had to turn to my own thinking, my own work. And probably, the day that they told me there was nothing that medical science could do, the heart had enlarged so much, the valves were so damaged, that they could not do anything about it. They didn't have bypasses in those days, and I didn't have the money, which probably saved the situation in my life. So we go on into trying to find a way. And there again, probably the most fortunate information I had received during this time was the fact that they could do nothing about it. There was no use going back in that road. I thought, well, if man is what's walking around, if it's related to what he eats, there must be something in that direction. So, again, with a little tiny vial of tablets, being instructed to take them if I had a heart attack and to get out of circulation as quickly as possible, that I might drop dead any moment. There was no hope for me. That was the beginning of a new life. And probably a very fortunate statement when they told me that was, it made me realize that I had been depending on someone else to get me well. Friends, there is no one else. It's you. And I learned that. We do more for ourselves than anybody can do for us. We need their help. We need their advice. But they can't do the work. So that impelled me into my present occupation or profession or whatever you want to call it. But I have lived the last 40 years in a very interesting, intriguing, searching world. I've learned what it is to build back a body, to build back organs they said could not be done, it can be done. So we go on down that line until we I began to study. I began to work in health professions, therapeutics of different kinds. I studied all of them. I took my first chiropractic uh, work in the 40s. Yes, I had to take it at night because I had to work through the daytime. Then from there, at that point, Nutrition was a dirty word in chiropractic field. They thought all they had to do was to stimulate the energy up the spine, and that was all that was necessary. One day I asked them, how do you keep a fire burning without any fuel? Which seemed to be a very logical thought. That's all changed as time has gone on, and we began to realize that fuel is probably one of the most important things that we have to deal with. Then, through my studies and work, I took naturopathic work, and I have my doctorate. I have 5,500 hours in naturopathy, all of them in active practice and study. There again opened a new field of thinking and application. And we begin to realize that really we do have some control over what we are if we only start in the right direction. You see, before this, as I, far back as I remember, you went to a doctor and he immediately told you that you didn't know anything about what you were talking about. You didn't know your own body. So he applied what he thought 
and what he had been taught conscientiously, but was it the right thing? So under these conditions, I began to go deeper and deeper into the study of nutrition. So when the University of Sierra States was opened up in Los Angeles, I became one of the staff members and also heading eight years of research and in the uh, nutritional department. There again, I was able to apply, to put into practice, to study and evaluate the things that were really happening when we laid aside drugs, when we depended upon the natural laws and applied the natural things that belonged to our bodies. Time went on, I spent four years in a cancer research at Spears Sanitarium in Denver, Colorado. Now those, that was not a full time thing, but we had so much time every month that we spent there in the study of cancer. Why cancer? It's no different than any other condition that is degenerative. If the chemical change is taking place in the cell, it's going to produce whatever is there. So I developed a way to find out, really, what we needed to know about ourselves. And I did find it very interesting. So today, I'm working at the same thought, the same level of thought. What is your body doing about what you are doing? There is one of the great questions that we need to ask ourselves and those who are helping us needs to know about. I found it very important the fuel you put in your body. You know if most of you use the same type of fuel in your automobiles as you put in your body, you'd all be walking if you could walk. Think it over. Is what you're doing supplying what you need and why? Now we've come into a totally different environment. During all these years, it's been gradually changing. What do we have today? I can go back 30 years, 40 years, when we could buy food that was nutritional. What do you buy today? You buy all sorts of pesticides, all sorts of deterrents that are already in the food, in the sprays, in the, uh, the fertilizer they use to promote more growth. That's more important than good quality. So we're down there now where we're seeing that change. Now we have another change coming in. Our water becomes involved. We're finding all types of poisons in our water. And the elements they use to correct the poisons are probably as bad as and in fact involved in what's happening to our people today. We look around. How many well people do you see? People who are really enjoying life. Not very many. They all have something wrong. Something that can't be treated seemingly. Something that is involved outside of our understanding. Now we're down to our vegetables and our fruits. 
I can tell you that every potato, which is a basic food, has the most deadly pesticide in it of any food that we have. And it's there in the fiber, I know. You buy an apple, another basic food, and you're buying a lethal dose of arsenic of lead because it's sprayed four times during its maturity. And that is in the fiber. People say, oh, I peel it. It's not in the peeling. It's in the fiber itself as well. What are we up to now? They radiate your food to keep it as long as it, it can't decay because there's no action left when that radiation hits it. What are we going to do about all this? Your government will tell you there isn't enough there to cause any trouble. I tell you, it's accumulative in your system when you keep putting it in. I found it. And it's basically back of many, many problems that we're facing today that are very common. Then we go into another field, the air. Do you realize that you have no oxygen to breathe? Very little. You're losing your balance. You can't think. You can't sleep. You feel terrible. You have no energy. That's one of the first complaints that I get. I have no energy. I simply can't hardly get through the day. Why don't you have energy? Because energy requires oxygen. I get phone calls from coast to coast and even from across the waters with the same complaint. When I went to investigate it, I found there are several reasons, and I had a little experience of my own. The air is filled with carbon monoxide. What does that come from? The fossil fuels that are burned in our cars, mostly. Not entirely, but mostly. It is the unburned carbons in this fuel takes the oxygen out of the air and out of your bloodstream. The arterial blood has no oxygen to carry to every other cell in the body. These are important things. And I've heard so many wonderful things here with your, our speakers. They have found part of the answer to most of them. I've only found part. We're only there at that point right now. We need to put all these things together so we can make it a whole picture. But we are learning where the problems are coming from. Even the birds are falling out of the air because they have no oxygen to fly with. Now, I have talked to the head, one of the head men at Sandia, who's in that department. And he said, do you know the condors are falling and we don't know why? I said, no, I didn't know they were, but I know they will fl fall because the large birds require more oxygen than the smaller ones. But it had already been happening. Our government knows about it, but they don't know what to do about it. So there again, we're left out here without any hope or help, really. So these are the things, this is not really what I intended to follow in my talk. 
But it seemed to me, listening to our speakers here, talking to people, and having a background that I have, I felt that we needed to get this operation out to the people. So they will know they're not dealing with something that can't be individually corrected, or helped at least. So these are the things that I work with every day. What are we going to do about it? Now we have this latest siege of the um, latest siege of flu and what's been what's been the result I think we're running out of battery can you hold Well, I'll have to see what I can do by hanging on. <laughs> I hope you all hang on with me. No, no. Mm -mm. Well, you know, when we understand the law of life, we always have a lot of it coming in if we prepared for it. The worst of it is we usually prepare for the worst, not the better. Now, back to my subject again. I want to go back to the atmosphere. And I was talking about our latest siege of, of uh, flu. It wasn't flu, friends. It was a low-grade radiation and it carried seven deadly radiated isotopes along with it. Now, I check all of this. I know exactly what's going on. And fortunately, I know how we can individually change it, help ourselves. And the amazing part of it is we don't have to go to the drugstore and spend 35 or 40 or 50 dollars for something to do it. Go to your kitchen. Pick up a package of soda, baking soda, and it will neutralize all of these deadly energy flows that we have. But it isn't dig enough, uh, dignified enough to be used in the professional field. I once had a friend who was a, a surgeon, and he said, what do you do for dysentery? I said, well, I use cornstarch. He said, my God, I wouldn't dare use that. I said, look, call it anything you want to, but help your people. These are the things that we run up against, the simpler things that we have, and you have them all. That's why I'm interested in getting this information to you, because it is handy. It, we don't have to go out and spend a lot of money. And you know, I found another thing. Money don't grow on trees, usually. 
so it's not always easy to come by. If this, and this is not the only thing now, I'm going back to the, what they call the flu. There was not a live entity in this. It was an energy. Now friends, all of the work I do, all of the evaluations I make, is based on the flow of energy. If we can understand just a little of that, we can help ourselves to a very great extent. People need help today. They're pleading for it. Some days I spend my entire day on the telephone answering calls for help. And that was what was happening when I got these calls, I can't breathe. I, I'm panicked, what can I do? I don't know where they get the idea that all I have to do is press the button and I have the answer. I found one thing when I did my analysis, that there was no energy, no oxygen, the blood was depleted, and when the blood doesn't carry oxygen, every cell in your body is depleted too. That is the result of your total lack of energy, your exhaustion. I had a family who had three children that they couldn't keep in bed at night. As long as they were active, they managed well, but they wouldn't lay down. That is when I made an investigation. Now, Years back, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, I was using ozone, oxygen in the university. We were using it in the clinic. I had learned something about it. So my mind began to search this out. Then a couple of my students are doing research in New York, and they sent me some of their late material stating that they were taking the blood and uh, filling it or putting the oxygen into it and then replacing it in the body. I thought, gosh, that's a long ways around. I think I know of a better way. Then I called a friend of mine, a, a doctor, and I said, do you know of any machine on the market that is within the range of the average person in price. Now the machine that they were using at this hospital was $1,500. That wasn't for the individual, or the home, or the office, or wherever you are. So he introduced me to what uh, was spoken of today, the Alpine Air machine. I called him said, if you send me a machine, let me test it out. I'll see if it works. I don't, I don't want to sell anybody anything except a good idea. I'm strong on that one. But to send you a, a, something to use, I don't know whether you want it or don't want it, need it or don't need it. But this, I felt because of my background, because of the things I had learned and used and knew to be a fact, that we had to do something to get the oxygen back where people could use it. And this worked. And it does work. It's a lovely machine within the price range that the average person can afford it. And that is a very important fact. So now we have the three children that couldn't stay in bed sleeping comfortably. We have people tell, calling and telling me, you know, I, I don't have that feeling of total uh, panic anymore. I can breathe. These things are important. And I want you folks to know that I have not even said what I was going to say in any way. I'm saying this because of my experience and my research into the field and knowing what I know on both sides of the paper. Now, if we 
have this terrible radiation. And you have some notebooks and your pencils. You better get them out. Because I'm going to tell you what to do when you get to the point where you can't go any farther, you can't get your breath. There's two ways to neutralize this lack of oxygen in our, our uh, atmosphere. First, we want to get rid of the radiation. Now, radiation will hold all of these other elements. This, of course, is my own interpretation. Remember what I'm telling you is my own findings, my own interpretation, my own experience. So, soda and salt will neutralize any type of radiation, usually. Your x-ray, any of it. Now, the portion that you use, you use a bath. You know, in the olden times, they used to get in the bath for almost everything, and they weren't wrong, believe me. And I think we're going back to that. So you take a tub of hot water, and I mean a tub full, all it will hold. Get into that tub as hot, the water as hot as you can stand it comfortably. And stay in that water until it cools down to body temperature. Now the heat brings all that to the surface. And when it cools, osmotic pressure brings it out into the cooler side. We're taking a therapeutic bath. Now, if when we get this low-grade uh, radiation, we leave the salt out and use just soda, baking soda, arm and hammer. And you need to take about two to three pounds to a tub of water. And you use the same procedure. You'll be surprised what that will do to level off so many of this, these conditions that we've been fighting to overcome. Now, our next step, and that is a Clorox, common, ordinary Clorox bleach. You know, someone in Albuquerque uh, called us the uh, Clorox dunkers. We use it in cleaning our foods and all of that. But now let's go back to our bath. A cup of Clorox in your bath of water and the same procedure used will neutralize some of the hard chemicals and the, the sprays and poisons that are backed up. You'll be surprised how that will clean out so many of these conditions that we haven't had a way to get rid of before. It's not expensive. It is effective. I think people all over the world are following my instructions and getting wonderful results according to what I hear. And believe me, friends, I hear from across the ocean, even South Africa, all over, people come for help and for information. We know it works because we use it. Now, these are the everyday things that we have to deal with every day. People say, well, I tried it and I felt so much better, but I feel worse again. Sure you do. You got another exposure. You don't clean this up. You keep working with it because it's in the air. It's everywhere. When you see the birds falling, when there is no more oxygen for them to fly with, 
And you ask someone at the head of the environmental department, what, do you, what does the government do about this? And they tell you the government can't do a thing. There's nothing the government can do. So then it's up to us as individuals to do this. And I tell you, friends, if you will try it, you know there's one wonderful thing about it. If it don't help you, it can't hurt you. You can't take one drug you can say that about. Now I'm going back again to our involvement in this recent episode that we've had. It was environmental. It was carried in on this wave of radiation. It was not a live entity. It was an energy on that rate. The antibiotics that was used was ineffective because it, there was nothing they could work on. They don't work on radiation. So that's why they had such a hard time. Now, we can't blame our doctors. They have never been exposed to anything of this kind. So they have to learn like we do. They're doing the best they know how with what they have to get along with, I can assure you. A man collapsed in my office one day, and I'm fortunate enough to be able to get him into an emergency hospital. And the doctors called wanted to know what I wanted done to the man. He was in a total state of collapse. I said, I'll tell you what I don't want done. Don't give him a shot of anything. But give him oxygen and he'll be all right. Which they did. And he walked home in about two hours. He was ready to go home. These are the things that come along accidentally, incidentally. Anyway, they get somewhere where we can study and do. I knew it was a total lack of oxygen that this man was suffering from because we'd had a very bad siege there. Now, we're in no worse position probably than any place else. But when it hits us, it hits pretty hard. All of these things come along in an everyday existence in my life. So I'm constantly involved in finding out why, where, and how. Then I give it to those, my students, who are ready for it, who want it, and who have an understanding of how to apply it through their classwork and all that they have attended. They help their families, so they go on. I have letters stating that for 15 years this man and family had been a student and they had never had to go to a medical doctor for anything more serious than an accident that broke a bone. They manage the simple things. Friends, most of these things that they say is incurable is so simple. Drugs don't touch it. It's the simple things that belong to our own physical environment that corrects what is wrong there and what we pick up that is wrong. It's in our food, it's in our air, it's in the water we drink. So again, we are living in a very dangerous time. And we need to know something about the natural applications that go on here that we need to apply to our bodies. And that's why I felt, thinking this over and studying it, that it was very important to give you this message so that you could help yourself in emergencies. Now I'm going into another phase that is a little off the this subject, but I did want to get this to you first. And I hope you've written down your instructions for your baths because they are very important. And I would like to add one thing more here. 
There is a solution that we make, and we've had to use it in this last episode that we've had to correct the radiation in our system. And that is to take a quart. Now write this down because this is a formula. Write this down. One quart of distilled water. Now why do we use distilled water? Because it absorbs and pulls out all these elements that are foreign to the physical well-being of our body. You, in that, you take one teaspoon of soda, one teaspoon of sea salt, and stir it until it's thoroughly mixed. Divide that into four doses. Now, your first dose then drink the next one every two hours until you have taken the four doses. And your system will be pretty well cleaned out. Now, when you compare the bath to that and put them together, you're, you'll be surprised at the results that you get. So, again, when we get these conditions, and you live with them. You have them every day. They're all there. And I see we only have 10 minutes. I wonder if there are any questions. Yes. Did you say what, when you did a soda and salt uh, solution, I didn't catch uh, what, or for the, for the bath, how much soda and salt? One pound each. Okay. Now, if you're taking a straight soda bath, Make it about two to three pounds. Okay. All right, thank you. Yes? Where did I see a hand here? I can't see back there in the dark. Hmm? All righty. There is no nutrition. You're drinking water. You're correcting a condition. So nutrition is not the point. You, you're, well, every four hours, yes. You shouldn't be taking anything else. You need the fluid in the system to wash it out and to neutralize what is there. Yes. Any other? Yes. For the bath, Epsom, salt, Epsom salts. Epsom. No, no, no yeah. plain ordinary sea salt is your best. If you get sea salt. Now, other than that, don't buy your iodine salt in the market. We want real salt. And you could use your water filter salt or your ice cream salt. It takes a little while to dissolve and all, but it it will work. You use your regular Clorox bleach, the old one, not the new. You want the plain, old-fashioned bleach. It's still on the market, thank God. I don't know what I'd do if it wasn't. Yes? What do you, do? What do you use for oil or whatnot for your skin after you have done all this soaking? Well, now, if you're taking the, those baths and they dry the skin, dry your body, then get olive oil and very lightly moisten your hands with it and rub it into your skin and it'll take care of the whole thing. It'll stop all the itching and dryness. But now I don't know of any other oil that will do the work that olive oil will do. And it's better if you get the virgin oil, the first run of your oil. Here's the thing, you, uh, they advertise uh, cold pressed oil. They heat it first, then they cold press it, and that's what they tell you about. So are we getting real cold pressed oil? But a virgin oil, olive oil, is never heated. 
It is cold press. Any other? All right. Yes. You uh, find that aspirin and other drugs interferes with the body's ability to utilize the oxygen in the air? I have never tested the ability of the oxygen. Anything that acts as a depressant will slow down the utilization of oxygen anywhere. But I do can tell you this. We did find in our research that one aspirin tablet will involve the digestion of your protein for 24 hours and change the whole picture. And in the many, many analyses that I run, here's what I find today. I find your protein intake is either very low or too high. I also find that the uh, the involvement here, when we check it with the things that are coming along, the involvement is always with what you have used as a drug. I could go on for hours, but I see I, we're at the end of our time. And I am asked if I have written a book. Yes. We have two books at the moment. One is the electromagnetic energy in foods. The other is man and minerals. Now, I did not bring them with us. We weren't prepared to take care of it in that way. But the man and minerals is $10 for the book, and the uh, electromagnetic energy is 950 And if you want to uh, send for it, if you write down the address, I'll give it to you. And you reach it with Par Excel, the Parcel Scientific Living, System of Scientific Living, 1605 Cole Avenue, C-O-A-L, Southeast, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87106. Thank you all. I hope I've helped.